I was just curious to know how many people in this room, if you would raise your hand, are over the age of 85. I just wanted to see what kind of minority I represent here. <laughs> Thank you. I had to address a group a few months ago at Grant McEwen, and uh, I offered my sympathies to them for being so desperate that they have to bring a guy my age in to speak to them. <laughs> but but uh, then I said, you have to understand, though, that we have something in common, your generation and my generation, and that is the one between. We don't like them. They're called the boomers. <laughs> the, the whole place just burst out laughing. And one professor got up and left. <laughs> anyway, I, uh, I wanted to talk to you tonight about a revolution. Uh, and the degree to which things have changed since I was a boy. And I'm now, I'll be 89 next month, so you can figure it out for yourself. But when I was being brought up in the 1930s, um, certain things were different. We sang, God Save the King. There was no, Queen was not reigning then. God Save the King at the beginning of every school day. We said the Lord's Prayer at the beginning of every school day. We had the Royal Mail delivering letters. There was no Canada Post yet. It was called the Royal Mail. On the 24th of May, it was the Queen's birthday. If we don't get a holiday, we'll all run away. <laughs> was what we said, but possibly three out of five people, including people my age, knew who Queen Victoria was. I doubt the, the, the proportion today would be one in a hundred know who Queen Victoria was and how she's related to the present monarch. Um, the The, 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 the oak, well, uh, there was a, a new patriotic song being played from time to time, uh, which my uh, aunt, great aunt, who was president of something called the Imperial Ordered Daughters of the Empire, regarded it as an offensive thing and would write letters to the editor because it was not the national anthem and should not be played as a national anthem. It was called O Canada. <laughs> That's gone. I mean, not O Canada, but as I'm, the, what I'm trying to do is depict the differences between then and now. Um, there may have been two parents on our street, two families, uh, where if the kids got in trouble, they did not get spanked. The other 50 parents on the, kid, on the street, they all spanked their kids. Today, it's a criminal offense in some jurisdictions. Another great difference is the, but the dominant thing towards the end of the 1930s and the beginning of the 40s, the thing that was on everybody's mind, without exception, was the war. And we were quite aware of the fact, or convinced that I think correctly, that if we lost it, we could very well be enslaved. There were populations, certainly had that happen to people in Eastern Europe, and uh, the, the uh, invasion plans of the German army later disclosed, when they were found after the war, that the German plan was to uh, move all able-bodied men between the age of 18 and 25 or something to Germany as labor slave labor, that's what they were going to do. So we were right. And a great many things depended on winning the war. And that cause united the whole country, except for Quebec, who 
didn't understand, I don't think, really what was going on. But it was a very, very different time to today. And it's this distinction, this difference that has occurred in our society that I wanted to talk about because I think it's, we know how it, how it took place and why it took place. But it is not confined to Canada or the United States or Western Europe. Some years ago, I think 1974, I, I went to England uh, on business and was stopping at a, in Yorkshire at a country hotel and there was a big sign up saying RAF 17, RAF 17 wing annual rem dinner. So I went around, looked, and there was a circle of about three or four guys in the lobby, five I think. I kept listening to them because they were talking in German. <laughs> and one of them saw me and he came over and he said, I guess you're kind of curious. Well, well yeah, what, what are you guys doing here? Well, we're here for the RAF 17th <laughs> annual dinner. And I said, yeah, but you were on the other side. <laughs> he said, well, what happened is this. He, he said, our guys, year after year, it had been 30 years, of course, since the war ended, our guys died. And we had a smaller and smaller meeting until one year, one of our guys brought a fellow from the RAF over to our meeting. We had the best meeting we've ever had talking to this guy because we were saying, where were you on the night of the 16th of July and August of night? We were trying to figure out if we were shooting at each other. And, and he, he, I said, well, is there no lasting resentment, nothing? No, nah, he said, they, they were doing what they had to do and we were doing what we had to do and that's the way we both looked at it. But, uh, he said, I'll tell you something. We are much, much closer to those RAF guys than either they or we are to the generations coming up behind us. We don't understand those people at all. And this, so it had the effect of unifying former enemies in this curious way. And as, as I say, this is the uh, change, the revolution. I wanted to talk to you. Have I batted the, you, can you still hear me all right? Yeah, all? Yes. Okay. Um, there were three revolutions occurred after the Second World War. They, there were some uh, evidence of them before the Second World War, but at, they, they came after the Second World War. They were the feminist revolution, the sexual revolution, and the education revolution. It's the third one I want to talk about because the third one had a far greater effect upon us than did the other two. It was necessary that the, the other two being the two, uh, uh, well, I, uh, I have messed up here, but I, I meant the feminist one was I, caused by the revolution in education. And the sexual revolution was caused by the revolution in education. So that it's the revolution in education that brought about these other two. And it, it's, we, we must, and as I repeat the word, we, in order to contend with the situations which we're going to I, th I think see visibly around us, we have to know how that occurred. The revolution goes back. How can I? They're going to see your rear end facing them instead of my nice fit. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Okay, go for it. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Better. <laughs> Thanks. Um, the Revolution is attributed usually to an American philosopher called John Dewey. And most people never heard of him. I just wrote a book on this, which I said, the revolution nobody covered. That's what I called the book, meaning the media didn't spot it. But uh, the core idea at the very center of it was this. 
you, nobody could know whether anything was really true. That is, you had your opinion and I have my opinion, but truth cannot be known. Neither can any morality be reconsidered absolute. See, everything's relative. And thirdly, uh, we can, we must educate children principally as citizens of a community uh, that they will acquiesce sufficiently in what they find around them that they will be easier for government and the state to control and sort of run. That uh, gave birth to changes in the school system which began roughly, they, they started up before the Second World War. Dewey really was uh, promoting them in the 1930s, but when the war came along, you couldn't be telling the populace there was no such thing as right or wrong or good or bad, because why would they devote their lives and have themselves killed fighting for them if they didn't exist? So we had to change what we were teaching. But as soon as the war ended, back they came. And the principal effect of, these, of this movement, one of them within the educational establishment, was the creation of the education faculties in the universities. They didn't exist before this time. To, to teach in a high school, you were required to have a BA or a BSc from the regular university. And then if you took one year and got what they called a B.Ed. At, at the end of that time. Well, gradually these, these uh, faculties wiped out the, BA, the necessity of the B.A. and the B.S.C. And all you had to have was the B.Ed. But the teaching in mathematics, chemistry, physics, and so on that the teacher previously had to have to get a B.S.C. or a B.A was nothing, uh, was, was much, much harder than it took to get the education version of those same subjects. This set in motion a decline in the standard, which has been going on for about 30 years. So that today, if you show grade 12 kids an examination that was written by all the students in, say, 1945 or 1950, a lot of the questions they don't even understand. There has been, we have been so fixed on the idea of having these kids adjust to live within a communal existence that we said that the idea of skill subjects, those subjects, is of secondary importance. And of course, our competition within the world depends a great deal on our students be regarding those subjects as of the utmost importance. So this change has been going on all over the time. And uh, uh, there was a rather remarkable fellow here in Winnipeg whose name was Wackowicz, his brother, I think it was his brother, was a very prominent judge here in, in the city. He got a job as principal of a school in a little town in southeastern Alberta, uh, when these changes were coming in and the Department of Education was saying you must stop doing this and do it this way and stop doing the other thing. And, uh, and he just refused. He says, no, he said my, my school, his school was getting some of the best marks in the, in the entire province. Why would we change? So they, they sent two inspectors out to uh, tell them bring him into line, and he called the parents. Youngstown is the name of the town this, this happened in. He called the parents meeting when the inspectors were there, and he said, don't talk to me, talk to these people. And of course, the people almost ran the two inspectors out of town. They, were, they said, look, at our kids are being, getting some of the best education in Alberta. What are you guys up to? And uh, <laughs> it was dreadful. They didn't know what to do with him, but Wackowicz, he, uh, uh, he was later hired, there was a rebellion in the education system in Edmonton against the changes. 
And they brought him in as director of curriculum here in Edmonton. I think he was here six years. The marks in the city just began to ascend up like this. As soon as he put in tests, exams, that kind of thing. And I said to him a few weeks ago, I said, if you were going to reinstate a curriculum such as you had, how much work would be involved in it? He says, almost none. I said, what do you mean? He said, you just have to go back and do a teach what we were teaching prior to 1945, get the same books and teach them the same stuff. You'd have to do it gradually because the, the, the kids uh, brought up under that educational system, you'd have to go back to kindergarten and lead it forward. But he says, that's what we should be doing. Instead of that, we've now got a government saying it's going to produce the most radical changes in education in the history of Alberta. We don't know what's going to be in it, but uh, Waka Waka Witch is uh, probably the most informed person on education that we could, we could have. In any event, this, the changes that we have seen resulting from this are, are of, a, of a very, very important nature. Uh, certain things are going wrong. One of them concerns children and marriage. I, I was, uh, a couple of months ago, I was visiting my daughter in California and she had a young couple living in her house. They were paying rent and so on. And she brought them out to introduce them to me and they said, are, are you married? And I said, well, I was. Oh, you're divorced. I said, no, no, my wife died. Oh, how long were you married? I said, 65 years. And the guy said, how long? I said, 65 years. He said, I can't imagine living with the same woman for 65 years. I said, my God, he's talking right in front of this. And I looked at her and she said, and I can't imagine living with the same man for 65 years. Well, I said, what about children? Well, they say that's the problem. And it's such a problem that the birth rate, and uh, what do what they, they, they call it? I can't, uh, the, no, anyway, our, our record of having children all through the Western world is becoming a major crisis. There won't be a Japan in 50 years from now because the women refuse to have children. And I don't blame them. <laughs> I don't blame them. If I were a woman, I'd refuse to have children. Why? Because there's no such thing as truth. And therefore, when he tells me he's going to support me all for the rest of my life and I'm going to have to take 20 years out of my life to raise two or three or four kids, I don't believe him. So I don't have children. Anything more mysterious about this? No. The philosophy has, duck, has imposed itself within the community to that degree. We have a major problem. We, we must have more and more people to keep the economy running. So what are we doing? We're bringing people in from other societies here. Some of them make better than Canadians than what we got here now. Others do not understand our system and are going to cause a lot more trouble than we know. And that is all a consequence of the educational revolution. Now, the, what has all this got to do with the Commonwealth Society? I think it presents us, I'll say, I'm not a member, but I certainly sympathize. I think it presents us with an extraordinary opportunity. Because what has happened now, the system is not working. Our standards of education are going down. We have uh, uh, the, the morality of uh, young people is really questionable what they're doing. We've got a revolution going on and the, the Department of Education is going to establish sex clubs and all the classes and so on. If the parents object, they're told to stay out of it because this is a government undertaking. The minister actually wrote an email to every kid in Alberta saying, if you want to join one of our sex clubs, you go ahead. And if your parents object, tell them they'll have to talk to me. This is from the Department of Education, from the minister. <sighs> anyway, that's what's ha the kind of thing that's happening. All the result, 
of the revolution because if there's no such thing as right and wrong, most of the sexual prop uh, proprieties disappear. Marriage itself, the foundation of it, has been destroyed by having it, you know, any two, any combination of people living together who love each other can be called marriage. That's what it's coming to. So real marriage has been disestablished or is being disestablished. Now, what we see happening around us and in government is extraordinary. People have, are losing their confidence in the government itself because it doesn't seem to know what it's doing. And they cast around for anybody who promises to make real changes. This is the explanation for the Trump phenomena in, Canadian, in American politics. This guy, he, sure, he sounded like an animal sometimes, but he would make some changes, whereas if we voted for Hillary, nothing will change. So that that extraordinary situation that's developed in the United States is a consequence of the education revolution. We have dawning on people a kind of wistful yearning. They want to get back to the way their parents and grandparents had things. And what have they lost? How did we lose them? We lost them because we lost our own minds in putting these people into office to begin with. And we've got to find ways of taking the things that your society stand for and making them real in the minds of people. So you don't, it's not so much a question of creating a political movement, I don't think. It's more like establishing a myth now, a myth is, you've got, you, that's a technical word. There are true myths and there are false myths, but the myth functions by inspiring people to live in a certain way. That's what I shared. That's what most of the people, my fellow over here, there's two of us over 80, said that. <laughs> that's what most of the people in this room shared and that's why you're here. And I think we've reached a point where we might be able to actually do something. But if we sort of try to act within the political movement itself, or within the political machinery itself, we'll simply get lost in it. What we need are young people who believe in these same things we believe in, and who can, as they grow older and more experienced, they can communicate these ideas to their own generation through the uh, methods of general communication, which means writing, journalism, or writing fiction with messages in it, which means writing certain kinds of music which means training some kind of, uh, your, yourselves in, in the arts in various ways. That's where the war was lost. That's how we lost it. We weren't adequately represented in the media, and the media made all the decisions. That is another thing. Trump, by the way, is broken. They don't make him anymore. He goes on, addresses everybody directly through this weird thing. I can't believe they call it a whisper or whistle or some damn thing. <laughs> it's, anyway, he just, he doesn't need the, 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 the media to, to tell, tell the people what he thinks. He can tell them himself directly. <laughs> this just drives them nuts. And uh, while he's a terrible man and he lies every second time, I don't think his lies quite number the many that Hillary told, but it'd be better if nobody were lying, I suppose. <laughs> but uh, he, he shook the tree and all the apples are falling down to the ground. And that's a good thing, I think, because we were living in a society that was broken and what I think had adopted an educational philosophy that will eventually either destroy the society or the society will suppress it. If you tell a whole generation with every educational device that you could think of that there is no such thing as right and wrong, you're gonna be in big trouble. 
and that trouble we're starting to see pretty clearly. We have, we're, we're confronted uh, with problems now that we should be able to solve and we're not solving them. One is the problem of Islam, which has been with us for, what, 1,300 years, hasn't changed much. And, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the people who more best understand this are the Muslims themselves. They don't like what they see at that same time. They're not sure what to do about it because if they, if they become too active, somebody will kill them. That's one of our problems, which we're not handling at all well. So what's the message? The message is know what the vision of your society is and find out yourselves how you can project that vision until it captivates the minds of many people, most of whom are looking for something like that. Thank you very much.